we had a very good uh, preferred practice guideline session in glaucoma and there was a lot which came through i'm a little stumped because some of our speakers are yet to arrive but we will have discussions we will make it a useful one hour 25 minutes for you all be sure on that and uh, 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 we would uh, start off with uh, our first speaker dr tamil and then we would have anagha talking and then i would talk and in that when you call uh, make the calls um we we it's uh, unfortunate that the expert panel have not yet uh, uh, joined in but i think as moderators we will more than take you through and keep you as uh, happy and occupied with it so our first speaker is going to be dr tamil who needs no introduction actually she's a um, a senior consultant cataract and intraocular lens services from the eye foundation group of uh, hospitals based at coimbatore a surgical trainer and she is going to talk on a very important topic update on modern formula and biometry preferred practice guidelines and i think that is so relevant for us if all of us want to be doing premium cataract surgery nowadays so on to you dr tamil thank you ma'am uh, good morning all today in the next few minutes i'll be covering on modern formulae and biometry one true yardstick to measure success is how well we are hitting the target refraction achieving this is an essential and also a complex aspect of cataract surgery i will per calculation is nothing but a simple arithmetic the only parameter which we measure is the axial length it is in the estimation of the keratometry we are forced to make some assumptions and when we enter the post op target refraction into any formula it starts predicting where the eye wall is going to sit in the post operative period this is the effective lens position and it gives the power of the eye wall to be implanted when we hit post op emetropia n6 it could be because of two it could be because of perfect measurements and formula in rare cases it could be due to two errors which could cancel each other what are the causes when we have post op refractive surprise in the past it could be because of incorrect estimation of the effective lens position axial length keratometry and weak reproducibility of the subjective refraction but now the axial length is off the list because of the unsurpassed accuracy of the optical biometer the rest three remains in the list whatever be the principle behind any formula all of which is trying to predict the effective lens position accurately so in eye with a normal axial length the barrett formula and the third generation formula gives the eye wall power within a close range so this tells for an eye with an average axial length and the k most of the modern formula works well what sets the new formula apart is the extremes of axial length and in the complex eyes this is because all the third generation formula takes into account of the two variables axial length and the keratometry and it assumes that the axial length has a linear relationship with the anterior chamber depth but this is not so 7% of the 9% of the hypermetropia and 13.5 out of 15% of the myopia have normal anterior segment so this is where the third generation formula miss estimate the eye wall power in the long eyes the barrett tk so and the srkt suggest an eye wall power which is significantly differ but the one good uh, uh, the one good outcome is that these are low powered eye walls and hence the effective lens position has less impact on the outcome the real challenge in these eyes is accurately estimating the axial length yeah, exactly. which is get done away with the optical biometry the short eyes are really challenging and we could see that there is a gross variation in the power suggested by barrett tk and hoffo q there are two challenges in these eyes one they are high powered eye walls even a small eye wall shift is going to give as a big refractive change and second thing the shallow acd because it could be because of two reasons one is the anatomical nature of the eye or it could be because of the increased lens thickness which could occur with age all the formula are trying to predict this and that this is why we are underperforming in the short eyes so what is the best we can expect it to achieve even with the newer formula is 92% of the target refraction within 0.5 diopters so how could one choose a formula we can look into the literature evidence but we should look that the study is based on a large and a clean data otherwise we can uh, do our own uh, uh, review of results where we are using different formula and this is one such study uh, done at our institute and we could see that the barrett universal 2 formula is performing excellent across all axial length post lvzi is really challenging multiple studies varied results even with 
best outcomes is within 75% of 0.5 diopters of accuracy. Our go-to formula is the Barrett True K formula and uh, the relevance of TK makes more sense in these eyes whereas when compared to the virgin cornea, it's going to increase the refractive predictive accuracy in these eyes. Toric eye will use variable toricity ratio, no financial interest. This is a web page from Alcon uh, Toric Calculator. Whenever we enter the axial length ACD in the eye wall power, the Toric Calculator should take into account of the effective lens position before suggesting the, um, the Toric uh, power model. So this is the same. Uh, I've entered all the three in web page, the two diopters of against the rule astigmatism, but just varied the axial length. So for a normal eye, it shows T5 model. Whereas for a hypermetropic eye, it shows T4. And for a highly myopic eye, it, it is suggesting T6. So use a calculator which takes into account of the effective lens position. Even though we nail the ELP on the table, it is going to change in few eyes because of the capsular and zonular issues. So what is the best we can do? Use a formula that is best suited. We use Barrett Universal 2 and it works well in our hands. If you want to compare more than one formula, I would advise you to compare with the Hill RB of 3. And always starts with the accurate measurement. Axial length it is best measured with optical biometry. If you're going to do an immersion, always look for the quality of the spikes and consistency in the readings. And always measure both eyes, even if the other eye is pseudo faking, and validate and check for consistency. Any difference in axial length, K, I will power between the eyes should be looked and re-measure. And verify the quality of the measurement, the screening opticians who are doing this. In IOL Master, we have this SNR value, which should be more than two with green signal, and always have this foveal fixation check. And for keratometry, always look at the LED myers. It should be crisp and clear. If there, if there is any teardrop sign, ocular surface disease should be ruled out. And al also, we can look at the standard deviation value, which should be less than 30 microns. In 70% of the eyes, our keratometry value is going to be good. It is only in the 13% where the Myers is going to be irregular. And always view with caution and take additional time and measurement to rule out ocular surface disease and cause for any irregular astigmatism. And this is going to improve our results to a great extent. So it's all about pre precision and tolerance of measurement before identifying errors. errors. So the future is we have to look for any breakthrough technology to effectively predict the uh, uh, lens position or else wait for the post-op eye power adjustment technologies to correct the re residual refractive errors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Tamil, for a wonderful talk. And uh, I'll take some questions. Uh, what I would want to ask you is, if you have access to total keratometry, uh, which, which would, what would it impact more? Would it impact the values, better assessment in a standard IOL power calculation, in a toric IOL power calculation and post LVC? Ma'am, standard power calculation, it doesn't have much effect, but it does matter in toric IOL power calculation and especially with also in post LVC eyes. And uh, if you are using immersion, we do not have optical biometer. How would you go about using the latest formulae to get to this? A few cases we have to uh, use immersion where we are not able to measure the axial length and uh, with optical biometer. So always when you're taking an immersion value, as I said, look for the quality of the spikes and consistency between the measurements so that uh, the value is correct. And we can enter these values, the axial length obtained from this and the keratometry value obtained by manual keratometry or the optical biometry into the online Barrett formulae and we can calculate the power. Even if you are going to, wanted to use a newer formulae, it is available in the APIS website where you can use it. One last question. Why don't you get ready for your talk? Uh, what are thoughts, Dr. Purinabhasin? Would you use a single formulae now uh, with the, some of the fourth generation formula and or further which we've got? Or would you want to put in different formulas for different kinds of eyes? Uh, uh, That's a wonderful question. And um, uh, as of now, we are using Barrett Universal 2 formula yeah. for all, most of the eyes. But uh, in high myopes and uh, when the axial length is more than 26, and in low, uh, uh, high, in hyper hopes, I check it with uh, uh, other formulas also, like Hill RBF and uh, with other biometer and we check it and then we look at the keratometry by pentacam we check if we are having uh, some uh, uh, difference in the keratometric value then we check it with the pentacam and then we look for, go for uh, the uh, the power calculation 
and that keratometry we enter into the uh, IL power calculator and then we check it. Because in, in uh, cases of toric lenses, when we have to do toric lenses, and in cases when the uh, astigmatism is high, then it becomes very difficult to find the right astigmatism which has to be addressed. Uh, but uh, uh, did you clearly explain to some of the youngsters in the audience that if we have immersion biometer, you take your K values, how you can go right up to the website and enter, you explain in your talk? You explain. I don't think anybody has any doubts in the audience. I think come clear. As Dr. Bar Dr. Purendra Paseen has said, Barrett's Universal 2 really does well for all those short eyes and long eyes and post LASIK eyes and uh, uh, eyes which have had RK or any other situation. But if in a situation you are in doubt, you could always look at something equivalent like an Hill RBF or some of the fourth or fifth generation formulae. But I would rather not you stick to the average regular IOL power calculation which are challenged in extremes of architecture of the eye. Ma'am, just one thing I wanted yes. to add in yes. post-refractive surgery cases, especially LASIK or RK, we need ideally you should use two or three formula so the ASARS online calculator is actually a combination of multiple formulae and it gives you average minimum and maximum but Especially then the you are stuck RK you, you should uh, target myopia in uh, if you have more number of cuts so you should compare the Hagee's L on the IOL master with the Barrett uh, true K as well as the uh, uh, ASARS online you have multiple and then see whether it's consistent and they are Similar or not. Okay, I'm going to ask Tamil. If there is going to be a difference in the three, which one would you confidently opt for? Because to my mind, ASCRS is sort of a summation and you have to use the least minus if it is a myopic uh, refractive surgery. So therein comes an averaging there itself. Between Hagis and Barrett, what do you say? Uh, our uh, results are good with Barrett True K, ma'am. True K, yeah, which is yeah, available yeah. with the Master. Barrett True K, if you yes. have, that is good. Yes. And uh, what I prefer yes. is if you have some uh, means to calculate the keratometry in 2 millimeter of the central 3 millimeter zone, uh, less than 3 yes. millimeter zone, because that is the reason yeah. which is effective, yes. it wor effectively working of the cornea. In post RK, so yes. in the yes. post RK uh -huh. uh, sheet, yes. you can also put in the one, two, three, and four millimeter ring values from yeah. the topography. Yes. Yeah. So that so gives you a very that's very important in the post RK. Mm. So if you put that, then you automatically you will get so the that central is what one. Is it has to be used because yes. otherwise we will always get a hyperopic, hyperopic uh, uh, residual uh, refractive yeah. error in post RK. And okay. what Dr. Anaga has said that we should aim for a myopia, mm. 0.75 yes. diopters of myopia. In yes, yes. Uh, we shall go, there is going to be a change in the sequence. The problem is there is a session which is going on which I never realized that all the speakers of the session are there. Actually, when I have to go there, I've sort of dumped the idea. But we will have enough questions to keep the discussion on and keep you all entertained. Let us start <laughs> the talks and we will take all your questions. We will send you happy out of this room, even if you have fewer speakers. So we shall now go on to Dr. Anaga Harur, who's another very dynamic uh, cataract and refractive surgeon, who's the medical director of Anil Eye Hospital and also member ARC West. And uh, she is going to be talking on a very important topic, small pupil choosing the appropriate procedure, preferred practice guidelines. On to you. Thank you so much, ma'am. A very warm uh, welcome to Tamil, all of can you. Can you come and sit here? And uh, I'd like to thank Chitra ma'am for giving me this opportunity. So I'd be speaking on small pupil management, no financial interest. So when you talk about small pupil, how small is small is actually a different uh, and very relative and it all depends on the surgeon's skill, his expertise, the experience that he has gained over the last so many years, the intraoperative situation and the iris tissue properties. So most importantly in the OPD, we need to look out for these patients in our routine cataract patients for the common causes of small people, it could be just senile, it could be a diabetic patient, pseudo exfoliation, because there are so many things associated with it. An eye face patient, so you need to ask for history, a post uveitis patient, or a, a patient of a ankle closure glaucoma, probably who has been on long term. 
So basically the technical challenges of a small pupil surgery is the reduced visibility at every step of the surgery. So you have to be extremely alert in these patients because at each step there can be a problem and it can end up with a poor visual outcome and an unhappy patient. So we need to fine tune our surgery. So first is the preoperative screening. So when you are looking at these patients also not only take the medical history because you can anticipate an IFS on table, also the detailed ocular history check what is the dilated pupillary size so you need to actually be ready and have your plan be ready with you you may need to fine tune your technique say for example some kind of pupillary stretching which may not be recommended in all cases now you need to fine tune your phaco settings so reduced vacuum or flow rate and an optimal use of materials like ovds and pupillary expanders so you should have a stepwise approach so we all begin with the preoperative midriatics but there are patients today who are allergic to dilating drops. So what do we do in such cases? So we have the intracameral agents today, for example, the Phenocane Plus, no financial interest, but it really works superb. And also the optimal use of high molecular weight viscoelastics. So for example, this was a patient who was allergic to dilating drops. And uh, you can see how the pupil nicely expands. It takes around 10 seconds. And then each step of the surgery can be continued with equal ease as if the patient uh, has been uh, you know, dilated with drops. So there's absolutely no issue with it. Now coming to the next step, obviously there are patients who are going to have adhesions or uh, post uh, post uveitis patients. So you need to break this sinicae. This was a patient of uh, trabeculectomy done. There is a PBIA also and the pupil is mid dilated. So in not in all cases you would definitely go in for a pupillary expander. So uh, this uh, procedure of pupillary stretching was done earlier. Nowadays it's not really recommended so much. But it gives you an adequately sized pupil for all you to go in for the uh, complete uh, phaco emulsification. So the capsular excess should be along the pupillary margin so you have an adequately sized excess and be sure to be in the center of the uh, eye in the central say 4 millimeter zone so that you don't pull on the iris. The moment you touch the iris it will keep coming into the phaco probe so you need to be really careful in such cases. So this was the post-op day one with excellent results. Coming to eye phase, we all know it's a triad of progressive meiosis, iris prolapse and billowing of the iris so you need to be extremely careful. So what works and what doesn't? So you can give pre-surgical topical latropine, you can use intracameral epitrate and uh, viscoelastics. Your wound should be really good. If you have a very short wound, uh, the iris will keep prolapsing. Very gentle hydro dissection. Even when you are using a bimanual, see that the uh, irrigation currents are not directed at the pupillary margin. Many times in these cases, you can use iris retractors. One just below the incision also helps and definitely pupillary expander. So the moment you find on table that the pupil is showing a lot of billowing go in and put in a pupillary expander there's no ego in it because during the uh, rest of the surgical steps if it comes down then you are in a soup what does not work is stopping flow max because that doesn't really reverse do not do pupillary stretching no sphincterotomies and do not overfill the chamber with ovd because that will only increase the prolapse you can also use a tri soft shell technique here now coming to the next part and that is the expanding devices uh, my threshold of using is quite low, any, especially in IFS. So, pupillary expanding devices, I would be speaking on the iris hooks, the melugin and the BX, though there are a lot of them available, whatever works best in your hands. So, this was a patient of pseudo exfoliation, the two eyes of the same patient, mind you. So, the one to the left is where the pupil was fairly well dilated, so I didn't find the need for using a pupillary expander, and one on the right was the other eye where it was slightly borderline but because it was a pseudo exfoliation I went ahead and used an iris retractor. Now in iris hooks you have to be very careful as to where you take the paracentesis. If it's too high then it will actually pull the iris or the pupil towards the cornea. If it's too low then it will actually bunch up the iris towards the edge and the phaco probe will actually scrape against the iris every time. So you need to be very careful about it. Also do not pull the iris hooks too uh, far towards the limbus because that can cause uh, sphincter tears and then you can have a problem like this. So you need to be very careful, uh, just a very gentle pull on the uh, pupillary margin. Now this was a patient, one-eyed patient post uh, uh, anti-glaucoma surgery done, very small pupil and we are using a melugin ring here. So this works really well, it has a biplanar structure and there are four scrolls with a preloaded one with the hook. 
so you can uh, easily uh, put each of the scrolls very gently along the pupillary margin and it works well it holds the pupil very well throughout the surgery so this is the preferred um, uh, expander of choice in many of our cases especially as it works really well and removal also is quite easy since we are short of time i'll just rush through uh, this is the pupillary expander so you have these alternate flanges with and without the hole above and below the iris so this was a patient with floppy iris where we are planning a multifocal IOL so you can see as I'm putting in the BHEX ring you can see how the pupil actually comes down so it is these cases especially when you're planning a multifocal IOL the BHEX is very very gentle and it has a very thin profile so it works well and it keeps the pupil well dilated so you use a 23 gauge micro forceps to hold on to it and the one the, the flanges on the side you can use the forceps and the or the Sinsky hook from the side ports so you get a nice 5.5 millimeter opening and you can continue uh, all the steps the removal is also very easy and uh, one second. So this was the post-op day one. As you can see, the pupil is uh, really well centered and round. This was a very interesting case. I think, ma'am, I'll just rush through because uh, time is up. Yeah. Want? Yeah. Yes. So just going to the end, uh, if you compare Malugan ring with BHEX, it's not just the cost that is different, but because the BHEX is jointless and uniplanar, it works really well, but it takes a little uh, learning to it. So once you do a few cases, you will really do well. So uh, just to conclude, all these pupillary expanders and cases of small people, you need to really plan your surgery in advance to get very good visual outcomes. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you very much, Anaga. That was a very wonderfully uh, discussed topic and meant to be done in six minutes. While Dr. Mahipal connects his uh, 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 slides, I would like to take one or two questions with Dr. Basin and, uh, and I would take your questions too. In a small pupil, when would you think you would want to use a BHEX, a Malugan, or when you feel iris hooks is the only answer? Um, I, iris hooks is the only answer. Uh, I mean, it's a better answer. No, no, it's not the only answer. It's a better choice. There's some time when you think it's better to do an iris hook. I may be wrong. I'm thinking of something and I framed this question, but uh, uh, would you have, you feel any of them you would take in whichever is there in your hand for all situations? I think I so, want my uh, audience to have the different opinions on this. I believe that if it is a floppy iris, I would feel more comfortable. Comfortable, I feel using iris hook is, is actually the best way to go with a floppy iris. Uh, I, otherwise, I, I, I would mind a Malugan's ring. But with the BX, I feel that the iris continues to prolapse. Yeah. But with Malugan, the BX. With Malugan, Malugan you are very much safer, yeah. ma'am. Yeah, very that's much the safe. difference I want to ask. Malugan is, uh, I think we can use whatever iris is available. Ma'am, I've used I multiple occasions uh, BX, and I'm very happy. But it's not just the pupillary expander. It's also the bottle height. It's the calibrated I side agree. ports. Yeah, it's how you manage and you not touch the pupil too much. So there are so many other factors. I think yes. any pupillary expander which works well in your hands. Yeah, but I felt BX would not be the best for floppy iris. You yeah, for floppy, I, I believe that yes, the, the original version of Melikin is better even yes. than the 2.0 version. Yeah. Uh, and of course, it's better than BX because right. BX is very thin and flimsy and yes. it, it tends to, you know, move along with the f iris. Yes. That's what I felt. Yes. And only one condition, ma'am, as you said, where I'd like to use iris hooks is very shallow anterior chamber yes. where it's difficult to put malignant ring or any expander. What I'm going to be doing is, I think Dr. Mahipal is in a hurry to leave. Uh, body language is saying that. So let's hear him talk. There are some more questions in small pupil. Maybe one or speakers are not going to be there. We will take all those questions. We will take your doubts. Okay, so on to uh, Dr. Mahipal. He needs no introduction. Our immediate past president, chairman, and medical director of the huge chain of say, CFS group of hospitals and uh, an amazing surgeon. And he is going to tell us how to choose the right IOE for your patient in six minutes, preferred practice guidelines. Okay, good. So Thank you didn't you. say an impatient Mahipal, right? <laughs> Because when I went for my fellowship to Georgetown, the <laughs> day my professor was giving me a farewell, he told my wife that uh, I have never seen somebody as impatient as my pal. Because if he thinks of an idea today, he wants that it should be implemented yesterday. <laughs> yeah. So anyway, six minutes you said, right? Yes. 
Huh? Yeah, okay. you need to rise to the challenge no, besides being impatient. I can't because there are more than... Anyway, uh, basically, I think uh, maybe you people could ask the lenses, but it's a very difficult topic to... We need not describe the lenses, your choices. Which, how, what the audience should know. Which should they put forward? AV team, please uh, check. I think uh, something. AV team, just please check. How could you take the next Thank question you. in Toric while it's getting done? I think you can call the next person because uh, this might... It's not going. So you can you okay. go out and again no, escape? I, I, I what do you think is the role of a pre-operative uh, atropine? Uh, it works in, not, not in all cases. Yes. In a floppy, uh, in an IFS which you know pre-operatively, would you routinely give atropine to these patients pre-op? Any of you would like to start atropine for I, this patient? I do give yes, pre Yes, even I would give it, yeah. yes. But some people say it doesn't work, some people yeah. say no, at least I, from the satisfaction point mind. of view, we yeah, give you would have got But shot. that's not the only thing no, we do, so I there are it's just one of the many things. Yeah. So yes. no, it's not that the many things. Nothing is the only answer. Atropine and non steroidal anti yes. Yes. yes, yes. I do not believe that stopping the uh, dr and, uh, drugs for uh, I, which act for IFS would help. But atropine and non-steroidal and all of these and keeping the eyes soft, everything adds up besides the intra-op procedures. Do okay. you so have anything to uh, add? Dr. Uh, uh, Chitra, the only thing is it's not just a question of whether it helps or not, but you can have a, a, a deleterious effect because you normally can give... Uh, Yes, patient can go into an acute retention yes. because you give atropine yes. for cyclitis or something subsequently, the patient can go into a retention because yes. you have stopped tamsulosin. So yes. please do not stop, stop tamsulosin. tamsulosin. That's very, very important. Yes. Okay. Can I start? Yes, now? yes, yes. Okay. So uh, you want me to only give the names or the choices or what do you want? No, you do. So you do. Anyway, uh, come, come. the cataract surgery today has evolved from phakic glasses going on to uh, good quality vision going on to reading glasses and then freedom from glasses that's what we are looking at uh, premium eye wells have become more and more popular and cataract surgery has today from a restorative surgery become a refractive surgery that is something very very important and patients expectation on perfect post-operative refractive outcomes because we are able to deliver reasonably perfect outcomes the patient expectations have gone and this therefore induces a high demand on precise biometry, high performance IOL power calculation, surgery skills and post-operative results management and the importance of counseling which is there. Uh, one important thing is I think this is something now standard. I don't know why the companies are still making the spherical, positive spherical lenses. They may be used only in some but now the aspheric lenses where we still have to decide whether it is a zero aspheric or it's a negative this thing. So which one you want to use uh, but I think this is something very very clear that an aspheric lens, a lens which does not compound the spherical abrasion which is there is a standard of care today. I think that should be the standard of care which is there. So this is something aspheric IULs. Uh, you can see in spherical IULs you are having uh, the uh, less sharp vision as you can see here and you can see the sharp vision that you can have in the aspheric IULs. Now next thing is what is uh, I have totally I would say my practice has been cannibalized all monofocal lenses have been cannibalized by this lens which is an eye hands lens. I think J&J &J has done a great job in uh, hitting the sweet spot of a price. It is not something that you have to tell the patient that the price is much higher. Uh, because it's only I think two three thousand rupees more than uh, the MRP so this is something which I feel is giving uh, has reduced the plus add significantly and there is a small bump in the center that's about it there is no dysphotopsia there is no glare so I think about 80 to 90 percent of my monofocal practice has been cannibalized I don't even talk to the patient there is no mismatch if the first eye has been done with a monofocal and you're putting a, a eye hands lens which is there. So this is uh, basically good even if you have retinal problems etc you can do that and this is uh, fitting into the lifestyle of majority the addition that you have and if you do a little bit of monovision uh, the addition can go down to even a plus one or something otherwise it's a plus 1.75 or 1.5 instead of 2.75 so this is a good lens for people who have uh, big arms and things like that and this is just called as a monofocal plus. So I would personally if I have to do a normal lens in a person obviously it is an aspheric lens uh, it uh, has the blockers 
and it is a lens uh, which is giving uh, a reduction in the amount of air that is required in these particular cases. Now again, if there is any patient who has a toric uh, requirement, you should ideally look at the posterior corneal curvature also because you have to look at the total K. So that is something very, very important. And this is just to show you the uh, uh, K value. So I normally uh, would use a toric lens in anybody who has an astigmatism more than one diopter. And because majority of my cases are today femtolaser assisted cataract surgery, which is say about 70, 80% of my practice, I would do an LRI up to one diopter. So the lens of choice for me, anybody having an astigmatism where I measure with the IUL master 700, the posterior K and therefore I go on for a toric. These are just ways to uh, mark uh, manually and this is uh, the, you could have a Varion system or you could have the Callisto system which is there and uh, uh, really not to show much. So this is the incision that comes on the Callisto and this is the, uh, you have uh, as to where the lens needs to be placed. That is something very, very important. And uh, the last should be a slight nudge which is clockwise for you to place the lens. Uh, you can me uh, measure it subsequently as to how and where the uh, lens is in the post-operative period. So that is, I think, toric lens. You have to ensure that uh, you get onto a toric lens if you are not onto a toric lens. There is no, there is no need for you to have a Callisto or a Varion, but uh, you need. You are a good surgeon. You can do a good in the bag placement. Please go ahead and do not refuse a toric IUL to a patient. I would say. I won't use a strong word like a criminal thing. It will be criminal not to give, but I think it will be a disservice to the patient if the patient has an astigmatism, which is a regular astigmatism, and you are not giving him or proposing him a toric lens. So that is my choice for a toric lens for these patients. Now, presbyopia, obviously, age more than 40, you have a problem, which is monofocal IOLs uh, will give you only distance, but uh, you know life is much more than uh, distance viewing. So you have intermediate. Most of us are on smartphones. The average time that you spend maybe one, two, three, four, five hours on it, and then you have to do near work reading. Even though newspapers are getting obsolete, it's still on the Kindle and on, on the uh, smartphones that you're doing that. But still, a lot of people need near, uh, near work reading uh, that has to be there. So multifocality, as I would say, there are three ways to go about it. You can do a monovision, you can do a multifocal IUL and an accommodative IUL. A lot of people have invested a lot of money on creating accommodative IULs, but I don't think that's the way life is going to go. Accommodative uh, is something which is dead and buried. Uh, as of things today, uh, none of these lenses have lived up to the, this thing. Now, uh, when you are looking at uh, the uh, lenses, again, there is, I would make a very strong statement that bifocal lenses are dead and buried. So there is no role today of the bifocal lenses. What you have to use is the trifocal lenses and majority of the companies have come out with good trifocal lenses. It is very, very important that when you're doing a trifocal or a premium lens that if there is an astigmatism that is there in those patients, that needs to be corrected because the degradation of the vision because of residual refractive error in a trifocal lens or a, or a premium multifocal lens would be much, much higher than it's in a monofocal lens. So that is something that you have to do and you have to look at still, uh, I would feel that uh, the trifocality or the presbyopia corrective lenses have come of age only if there are no ifs and buts. That means that that kind of situation should dissipate. That you can like in eye hands, that is totally dissipated. I don't even discuss with the patient. I have done it for invasive cardiologists. I have done it for ophthalmologists, orthopedic surgeons, and they're pretty happy with that particular thing. So there is something that is, so still you have these problems, which is there. But astigmatism that I have told uh, <coughs> is something very, very important. There are two, three things that a, that a doctor should invest in. One is a good FACO machine. The second is a good biometer because that is going to, and the third is a good microscope. So these are things which I feel are the things which you should invest and maybe today also an OCT which is there. So biometry is something very, very good uh, that you need. Dry eyes is something, corneal scarring, etc. pupil which is not uh, dilating and un unstable capsular support is something very, very important because then if your lens decenters, there's a problem that you have. Glare halos to be told. I wouldn't go into the detail, the angle alpha kappa, but there should be a, a centralization of the whole thing which is there. So uh, newer IOLs which are there, the extended depth of focus lens which was uh, by the uh, symphony that came in and then we have the Vivity today. I would again 
my it has gone out of my practice today because if a person I have to give no glare, no dysmetropsy, I'll go for an eye lens. And if I have to uh, give a person good reading ability and everything, I'll go for a trifocal lens. This vivity or symphony still requires the add on an eye hands, uh, maybe uh, nearer to two and here the add in a VBT or in a symphony maybe 1.5. So you're really not shaking the barrier uh, significantly and the charges should not be very high. And these are trifocal lenses which are there. My pref uh, preferred, obviously, uh, majority of the trifocal when you're looking at a panoptics, it works at 40 centimeters, that's what it is. But you have actual reading should be at 33 centimeters. So the lenses, according to me, which are my preference today, uh, which give you 33, per, uh, 33 reading is the Zeiss 80 uh, Lisa, where people, a lot of people think that there is a lot of PCO. We have just uh, done a multicentric study. The results will be out. The incidence of PCO is not very high at all. And they are the most price sensitive uh, lenses. So this is the uh, tri, which gives 50%, 30%, and 20, which is there, uh, gives you 3.33 uh, addition, you're looking at 1.66 and you're looking at the distance region that is there. Uh, I won't show you the video and uh, the CRV is a marriage between a trifocal and an EDOF. So that is a continuous range of vision where you can have the lens going from inter near intermediate distance and in between there is an EDOF which is there. So these are also results which are pretty encouraging that we are having and uh, this is uh, the uh, Synergy lens, the only problem with the Synergy is that we don't have a toric variety in this. So I can't work without a toric. So this is just the lens which is going in, which is there. So in a nutshell, it is our responsibility to match the right IOL to the right patient. Natural crystalline lens is a perfect multifocal lens and basic purpose of a multifocal or trifocal lens is to restore accommodation in a pseudophagic patient and independence from glasses. So uh, just uh, to say that this is all that I, have to say monofocal, my lens of choice, monofocal plus, I, I hands is my lens of choice, toric, you can go in for all the majority of the torics. Stability of the lens post-operatively is something very, very important, how stickable it is. And in the uh, uh, lens for uh, giving you for a press biopic correction, I'll go in for a trifocal lens, but the toric element has to be corrected. And uh, there are, I think, uh, three Indian companies also make uh, good trifocals. You have uh, the uh, CRV, uh, you have the Zeiss trifocal, you have the Panoptics, and you have the Indian companies uh, tri, you know, or whatever they, uh, I don't use much of them, but that is what it is. So I think uh, that is what I have to say, and thank you very much for your kind attention. Actually, it's a talk which needs 45 minutes if you have to do justice to it. I had wanted him to just delineate the points. Now, I have one question before I get my before I present my, uh, start my talk, when you're doing a mix and match, what would you give importance to? Would you decide, keep the same material? How would you do? Dr. Sanjay Chaudhary? See, ah. in a mix and match, it, it really is that what really matches the other side. And if it is a monofocal, I would prefer something like an EDOF lens, which matches well. Yes. A monofocal with a, a trifocal, could do, but it's not a preferred option. Yeah, I think we should, it is my thought, I stand to be corrected. Mix and match, preferably not the same material, but it has been done. But you could do micro mono vision between the two eyes, the same lenses in the extended depth of focus uh, lenses. Again, the micro mono vision should not be more than 0.75 diopters because there'll be a loss of stereopsis and contrast sensitivity. So within maybe 0.75, we could do a change. But having said that, we have done uh, 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 one lens in the other eye and a Technis uh, 4 for near eye in the other eye. I just wanted the controversial thoughts to come up with it. Do you have anything to add? Yeah, so symphony and synergy is ah, matching, but uh, whatever, see, it's on the evolution. The point is when you had the bifocal, you could put a lens which was uh, an intermediate bifocal lens versus a uh, near bifocal lens in the other eye. So that could be mix and match and you could do a monovision in a symphony or a VVT. You could uh, do an overcorrection for one eye, which is the dominant eye for distance and the near eye, you could do an overcorrection. And now I think the CRV is matching well with the symphony that is there. But again, these are then showing the imperfections of the lens. Jab ye, uh, when uh, you don't need to use your kidney, so that is the time when you actually, the lenses have come perfectly. So the brain damage should not be there. Uh, that is something very, very important. That is when the trifocals will come to age. Thank you very much, Dr. Mahipal. And uh, uh, 
uh, let's, uh, I'll even I need to be uh, punished if I'm going to be late. So, uh, the, so my due in the next few minutes is to tell you about dissatisfied multifocal IOL patients, uh, what is to be the treatment guidelines for them. There are, we do need to understand that it's no longer a common problem. The multifocal IOLs of the present day, be it Indian or my importer, are doing extremely well extremely well and there have been different studies which have told us, different studies which have telling us today, 94% in the Concerto study and 98 in the Harmony study and in recent US FDA study with all the latest IOLs that there's a good majority of the patients want the multifocal IOL in the second eye. But then there are these reasons for a 6-6 unhappy patient and we need to address each of them we need, cannot get defensive, we need to ferret out the problems, we need to separate the problems. Is it some kind of a visual disturbance we treat differently? Is it that the patient has great vision for distance but not so for intermediate and near, we'll need to treat differently? Is it that the patient was seeing very well initially and later had a visual drop, which could be a PC or similar, and we need to treat differently? So we need to do, look at the ocular surface, the dry eye status, the IOL centration, the PCO, the macula, the refraction. If it is a small refractive error, we could look at doing a PRK or a LASIK. PRK could be fine if the corneal thickness allow, the ocular surface is okay. But if a patient wants an immediate result, immediate yeah, effectivity is very complaining, you would end up doing a, la a LASIK for him because you do not want him to be further disturbed with the healing response of a PRK. Again, PRK and LASIK may not help if the residual error is a hyperopic error, when in you need to think of putting in a piggyback lens or the patient is really sitting on your head and is very unhappy, you would have to think of doing an IOL exchange. And if it is an IOL exchange and you know that there is no other cause, for the visual disturbance, then please do not delay removing it because the more the fibrosis, greater the challenge, but it is easier to cut a hydrophilic as against hydrophobic. Sometimes you could even leave the haptics in the capsular bag and then cut, take out the optic and position another lens. Not showing the video. Again, if you're going to put a piggyback lens in a hypero, you need to choose a large optic. We have Sulcoflex lenses, we have the IOK lenses, we have the different companies, Indian companies which have come forward, but they have a posterior cur curvature on this lens so that you have a space between the primary lens and this lens and the indulating haptics ensures it sits well, sits well and we do have Nichamins nomogram wherein in the myopic residual error the same power can be put for a hyperopia you need to multiply it by 1.5. We need to look at the uh, vault. Now, if it is a toric IOL which is sitting there and it is bothering, then we could go use the Barrett treatment formula or the astigmatifix.com. Decide whether you're going to do bioptics for this patient or whether you're going to rotate the IOL of this patient or whether you're going to do an IOL exchange. And it tells you and you follow it accordingly. But if you're doing a toric rotation, sometimes in a high myope, you would want to put a CTR2 because these capsular bags are larger bags. But when you know in spite of it, you're going to have a residual, might as well do a laser vision correction right away rather than doing mix and match. So anyway, if the first eye is going wrong, please slow down for the second eye and you could consider a blended vision. Like in this particular patient, the patient underwent a, a symphony alt, uh, multifocal in one eye, had a little, was not unhappy, uh, happy for the near vision. You could go ahead and place, do a micro mono vision for this particular patient and place a symphony with a 0.75 uh, under correction and in this particular, I'm sorry, in this particular patient, patient was so unhappy with the near eye, so we had to do a technis plus four for him in the other eye and the patient actually turned happy. I made a mistake here and in this particular patient, the first eye was a symphony, but the patient had great intermediate vision, but was not happy with the near vision and we went ahead and did a micro mono vision and targeted for 0.75 myopia in the other eye and the patient did well and here the patient had a significant near vision difficulty and in fact we had to change it from in focus and put an accretive lens and that seemed to take care of the problem so there are different ways that we need to address this you need to look at the ocular surface we need to understand dry eye cannot be ignored it could be preoperative which you have missed or it could be caused intraoperatively if it has been caused intraoperatively in Initially, there was no dry eye, then treat him with anti-inflammatory lubricants. If there is a meibomian gland dysfunction, treat the, do the lid hygiene, the warm compresses and whatever wish you can. Have this kind of a figure to show your patient that you have a meibomian gland disease which needs to be treated. 
if it is a capsular bag there's a pco don't hit it right away be sure that there's no other cause only pco which is disturbing because you can't do an iol exchange if you have gone and done a yak capsulotomy so wait for at least 3 months be sure that the macula is all right there's no pathology which has got missed out there and then go ahead if the iol is not centered you never know a patient has come from elsewhere the haptic might have been broken you need to ensure but nowadays the newer premium lenses have a large optic zone so even if you have an angle alpha which is more than 0.5 or even 0.8 it is quite forgiving so keep this in mind and this was a patient who came with decentration he needed a toric iol rotation but he also had a small area of zonular weakness and by placing a ctr and a toric iol rotation we could sort him out these are the various kinds of macular problems which you need to refer to your retina person when you talk of visual disturbance it could be a positive dysphotopsia negative dysphotopsia positive dysphotopsia and negative dysphotopsia are largely because of the modern square edge lenses and the high refractive index of these lenses but neural adaptation sorts most of these cases and lots of reassurances invariably they are all right rarely they need an exchange but in negative dysphotopsia which again is because of the refraction of light from the edge and the posterior surface going in different directions a lambertian light scatter occurs and in this particular case you could rarely try a sulcus placement of a zero par piggy bag iol or a reverse optic capture could be tried and most importantly you need to choose the right patient you need to explain to the patient you need to keep the thought of iol exchange as one of the options but i think planning before well in advance is best for this patient you have a range of lenses and even if the patient has a little residual error if he is a happy patient don't go after it for your level of perfection let him be because he is a happy patient anyway and that's all that matters thank you very much there are more slides but i wanted us to all go back thinking that we need to have a conceptualized approach open to the challenges and we would have treated most of these dissatisfied multifocal iol patients thank you uh, if dr mohan rajan wants to go next he could and then harshul would go yeah yeah dr and, partha uh, is dr. also partha there partha sir also has come i think partha you he want to here, come in yes. if maybe a uh, mohan let partha mohan partha can come because he has to run all over sorry mohan yeah i'm going to go okay mohan okay so allow you to go don't get him uh, excellent talk ma'am ma'am can i ask you a question yes, yes. ma'am if there is a patient of First multifocal iol has allowed me to go <laughs> <laughs> a patient uh, of multifocal iol where all the parameters are perfect a very well centered lens no ocular surface disorder nothing and no refractive surprise nothing and the patient is complaining of glare and halos okay how would you i mean you know that neuro adaptation is going to be there but if the patient is extremely unhappy at what point of time would you take the decision of an iol exchange earlier i might have we had a patient like this ma'am please speak into the mic yeah. had a patient who had the dysphotopic symptoms plenty of reassurance was done he was not feeling settled we did take our 6 months on the neuro adaptation and all those things but after he placed a zero part piggy bag uh, sulcus iol he really became fine it was like magic in our entire career maybe we would have removed an iol only on two three of these patients you understand unless we may have rarely lost it earlier days the present day multifocal with the four generation formula and the kind of uh, uh, target emetropia with which our awareness of dry eye disease and our the way we all look at the oct and the macula i think unhappy patients are far and few but in that remote situation anaga wanted me to add that iol exchange is always there in our hands thank you but how do you explain no. that piggy back zero iol in in a trifocal lens no if it no, no, is if no. it is talking of dysphotopsia yeah? i'm talking negative of dysphotopsia, dysphotopsia. Yeah. she was yeah, talking yeah. of glare glare yeah, yeah. and dysphotopsia yeah, only yeah. for that negative dysphotopsia yeah thank you that's an option Uh, you have six minutes, no? Yes, sir. Yes. Sir. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Chitra and the ARC for the wonderful opportunity. Hello. I'm going to talk to you in the next six minutes about the preferred practice guidelines as far well as PCR is concerned. So, anticipate PCR. We have a traumatic cataract, cataract post vitrectomy, and uh, posterior polar cataract, and uh, brown cataract, pseudo exfoliation. These are the conditions where you need to anticipate PCR. Plan. Have a plan A. b c for these patients so when you have pcr please understand this concept this concept will be understand then the whole pcr management becomes easy when you have pcr the coaxial irrigation aspiration should be stopped 
coaxial irrigation aspiration means the irrigation and aspiration are in the same port so if you have coaxial irrigation aspiration the pc is open that will open that will enlarge the pc tear number one number two that will hydrate the vitreous vitreous is like a tsunami it will come more and more vitreous will start coming into the anterior chamber but if you have a bimanual bimanual means you separate the aspiration from the uh, uh, from the irrigation so if you have bimanual that will tamponate the pc break and prevent the hydration of vitreous and you can go in and just, uh, remove the vitreous from the anterior chamber uh, so that is on the paper when the people are area if you have a small pc tear if you have a small pc tear convert that small pc tear into a posterior capsular rexus why because if you have a small pc tear and you try to uh, extend that pc tear or put a lens that uh, that lens is different that tear is going to definitely extend but if you have a posterior capsular rexus is as good as a anterior capsular rexus very very important so if you have a small pc tear try to convert that into a posterior capsular rexus and you can go ahead and put a lens in the bag as in this case <coughs> this is a common scenario when you have pc tear do not pull out do not pull up because you become jittery and pull out and what happens is what is a small pc tear becomes a huge pc tear and more vitreous will start coming into the so immediately go bimanual and uh, remove the vitreous first and then remove the cortex remove the vitreous which is there in the pupillary area this was taken long time back at that time the tricot is not available and uh, pray for the uh, the nucleus if you pray to god the nucleus will come up like this okay so again very very important you can see here this is a pc tear which occurs because of the last nucleus uh, bit uh, uh, what i'm trying to do is i'm not losing my calm i'm injecting viscoat i'm injecting viscoat which is a dispersive you go and plug that pc tear so with injecting viscoat and gently remove that phaco pro from the eye and then shift immediately to bimanual create a right side port immediately a bimanual that is aspiration is separated from the irrigation and then look for any vitreous is there vitreous is in this case the vitreous was there and they had to do everything but always remove the vitreous first you can see here in this particular case so again you can see here i'm trying to remove the uh, epinucleus in a posterior polar cataract you can see all of a sudden there is a sudden deepening of the anterior chamber and the pc thing immediately i put viscoat and then i didn't pull out of the eye inject viscoat recreate right side port immediately put tricot preservative free tricot there and then remove the vitreous which is there don't be in a hurry to remove the cortex and the epinucleus always remove the vitreous how do you see the vitreous even god cannot see the vitreous without tricot i'm sure partha will agree with me because partha is a strong proponent of it preservative free tricot one in three dilute uh, the dilution you put it in the anterior chamber and it delineates the vitreous and can go with a high cutting rate which is available in all the phaco machines in this particular uh, this thing you can see here this uh, particular thing you can see here what i'm try, uh, try, trying to do is a posterior polar cataract you can posterior polar cataract you can see one of the most important things to keep the rexus correct that is rexus correct size you don't want a very big rexus you don't want a very small rexus why you don't want a big rexus because you want to capture the lens later if the pc tear because sometimes they can have a uh, many times they can have a pre existing tear so in this particular case you can see here i'm trying to remove the uh, uh, the uh, the nucleus using the slow motion technique not to rotate the nucleus and all that and uh, you can see here i am uh, once i remo remove the epinucleus you can see there's a large pc tear which is pre existing you can see the typical two pillars on the posterior capsule which are very typical of this uh, posterior polar cataracts immediately i put tricot there remove the uh, all bimanual use automated vitrector all bimanual remove the vitreous first and then remove the cortex and then in particular case you can go ahead and put a lens in the in the haptic the multi piece lens or three piece lens in the haptic don't leave it uh, in the sulcus don't leave it in the sulcus go ahead and capture this the haptics are in the sulcus but the optic is getting captured into the capsular excess margin the end point is the overlayation of the anterior capsule this lens gets locked completely and this lens will not move a micron there's no ugh syndrome this lens is as good as is the bag you can see here this particular case and you can do a pass plan of vitrectomy in this particular case i think uh, i'm showing this uh, vitreous in the anterior chamber i'm doing a pass plan of vitrectomy only problem is in the pass plan of vitrectomy you need to be a little conversant in uh, 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 in doing the uh, uh, trocar and cannula uh, i'm putting an uh, anterior chamber maintainer as well uh, then going ahead and putting a 
trochar and cannula into the uh, 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 into the vitreous cavity it's always better to remove the vitreous from behind but only thing is it, it involves a little bit of a learning curve as in this case you can see here i'm putting the tricot there and then going ahead and putting a trochar and cannula into the vitreous cavity with an anterior chamber maintainer i'm trying to remove the uh, lens which is uh, i'm sorry vitreous from behind which makes life easy because uh, remove less amount of vitreous there's no traction in the vitreous base and uh, uh, there is no pulling effect there's always always cutting from the base that's uh, again very very important so the take home messages as far as ppp prefer practice guidelines in pcr small pcr convert into pcc do not pull out inject viscoat use tricot preservative free bimanual automated vitrectomy either limbal or pass plana which are comfortable remove the vitreous first and then remove the cortex and epineucleus appropriate i will depending on the support whatever you have and then i always suture the wounds when i have because the incidence of endophthalmitis goes up by almost four to five times so i sutured my all my wounds if i have a pc tear and a vitreous loss so that is the take home message i want to give thank you very much chitra for the wonderful opportunity thank you very much aos and the chairman scientific committee also Thank you very Thank much, you, Mohan. I would want Dr. Ram Murthy to get connected. Thanks so much, Partha, for being so obliging. Chairman, Scientific Committee is obliging. I think we need to give him a standing ovation. And the next important uh, thing is, would you want to, Dr. Mohan, and I think would take a thought from Dr. Sanjay Choudhury, first from him, would you want to do a, when would you do a pass plana vitrectomy and when would you do an anterior vitrectomy? Very briefly till he gets connected and my moderators would take care and I'll just come back. So, nothing like a pass planar vitrectomy. However, a pass planar vitrectomy for an interior segment surgeon is a very different area of work and an interior segment surgeon does not feel very comfortable with the pass planar vitrectomy. So, when you are not comfortable or you don't have a retina surgeon at hand who can treat, uh, teach you better, it is better for that 95% of the people to go in the interior, interior route and do a fairly deep core vitrectomy to get all that vitreous out from that area but still you can't get the vitreous out from just behind the posterior capsule that only a pass planar can do thank you so yes, much sir, sir. Uh, welcome dr ramurthy sir for the, your presentation so he is the most dynamic and the most uh, knowledgeable uh, doctor that uh, ophthalmologist that we have seen and especially in the last covid times in all the webinars he has been on our expert panel and given us pearls of wisdom so, uh, looking forward to your talk, sir. Thank you so much, Dr. Anaga, for this nice introduction. The topic given to me is getting the best out of your toric intraocular lenses. <coughs> I'm going to just give you about six pearls in the next six or seven minutes. Uh, do not go use the refractive astigmatism because there could be a lenticular astigmatism which could contribute to it. Another, another important pearl is that refraction may not under, may underestimate the true keratometric astigmatism. Look at this case, they, you do not really need an eye trace to do toric intraocular lenses. But just for an example, this is from the uh, internal optics of the eye, this is, from the, this is from the cornea, this is from the internal optics. Almost the entire astigmatism that is there in this particular eye is from the internal, uh, internal optics. Once when you do a cataract surgery, obviously the cornea is quite pristine and there is no cylinder that's needed. So obviously you do not go by the uh, cylinder on the, on the spectacle lenses. This is the kind of variation that you could have. That almost a 1.5 diopters, the cylinder completely goes away once the uh, lens is removed. On the other hand, there can be a situation like this also where the lenticular astigmatism and the corneal astigmatism almost neutralize each other because of which the patient is not having any uh, cylinder on the glasses. But once the lens is out, almost a diopter and a quarter of astigmatism becomes manifest and uh, hence a toric intraocular lens might be a consideration. So don't go just by the spectacle refraction as far as consideration for toric intraocular lenses is concerned. Use the right instrument and formula for the biometry. I, uh, my favorite is the Barrett uh, Universal two formula, most often we go on to the Barrett toric calculator to decide whether the patient needs a toric intraocular lens or not. And based on that, we go ahead and uh, counsel the patient for toric monofocals, toric multifocals, or just a plain monofocal implant. And uh, it's not just the uh, available the access to the right formula, it's also important that you uh, invest in the right kind of optical biometer. There are several different options available. All of them we have experience with and all of them work quite well in different centers once you understand them. And uh, just in case you do not have access to even one of them. What is this? Sorry, I'm sorry.
just in case you do not have access to one of them, uh, even if you are using a conventional immersion A scan along with a keratometric reading, still you can go on to the ACRS, APACRS websites and you can access this IOL formula which is available right in the uh, front page of the websites and you can get the benefits of using this formula and I find that even in centers where we do not have an optical biometer, we use this formula giving excellent results as far as the final intraocular lens power calculation is concerned. And ex especially if you are implanting a multifocal intraocular lens, it's important that you take care of even small amounts of cylinder. This is a, a time in which just then the trifocal span optics has come into being. This is a patient with a plus 0.87 diopters of with the rule uh, against the rule astigmatism. We went ahead, panoptics toric was not available at that time. We went ahead and implanted a uh, plain panoptics lens. And what we found was that the patient had excellent near vision, but was quite unhappy for the distant vision requiring a uh, mixed astigmatism glasses and had an uncorrected visual acuity of 612. So we actually counseled the patient that we will take him up for laser vision correction three months later. But while waiting, he decided to go ahead with the second eye surgery. And in this case, we went ahead and had a look at the toric calculator. And for almost a similar amount of astigmatism, the patient required a T3 multifocal intraocular lens. And that's exactly what he got, ending up in the left eye, as you can see over here, a 6-6 six, six and 6 uh, near vision, as well as a distance and near vision, as well as excellent intermediate vision. So we took up the um, first eye, which had received a, a plain multifocal intraocular lens for a laser vision correction subsequently. So the importance of dealing with astigmatism, especially if you are uh, contemplating a trifocal or multifocal uh, intraocular lens cannot be overemphasized. You also have to understand that with the rule astigmatism and against the rule astigmatism are entirely two different animals and they have to be dealt with accordingly. For example, this is a case of uh, um, uh, uh, against the rule astigmatism mm -hmm. and what you find is that for about uh, less than a diopter of astigmatism the patient actually requires a T4 intraocular lens. On the other hand if you have a with the rule astigmatism of almost 0.75 diopter lenses uh, astigmatism still it's a non-toric intraocular lens that is required. So the reason I am emphasizing it is often I am asked what is the power beyond which you consider a toric, toric uh, intraocular lenses. It's not an exact number. It also depends upon whether it's with the rule and against the rule. The best thing is to go ahead and feed it into your toric calculator and see what exactly is the power that it throws up and go by that. And uh, well, another most important aspect that you need to understand is that for a sub 2.4 millimeter temporal clear corneal incision, the surgically induced astigmatism is just about 0.1 diopter. We have understood now that uh, the astigmatism induced by any surgical incision has both a direction and magnitude. They tend to neutralize each other because of which the centroid value of the astigmatism induced is just about 0.1 diopter. For a long time, I used to consider that my 2.2 millimeter temporal clear corneal incision induces 0.4 diopters of astigmatism. Now that concept has completely gone away. We no longer con uh, calculate our surgically induced astigmatism. If you're going doing a 2.8 millimeter incision, it might be in the range of about 2.25 diopters. But if it is, uh, say, if it's 2.4 or less, it's just about 0.1 diopter. The final tip is that you owe it to yourself and your patients to correct whatever residual astigmatism uh, adequately and appropriately. For this, again, Barrett comes to your uh, help with the uh, Barrett RX formula which tells you what exactly is the best modality uh, uh, for that particular patient. For example, this is a case where I implanted a 24 diopter T4 lens, and this is what the patient had as a residual error, plus one with 2.5 diopters of cylinder. Mind you, rotation of the lens will work only if the spherical equivalent of the residual re uh, refractive error is almost zero, like in this particular case. If just a plain cylinder or a plain sphere, just rotation of the lens is not going to play an imp uh, any role. So in that case, you might have to do a piggyback lens or a exchange of the lens. Here in case you are exchanging the lens or are doing a piggyback, again, this formula helps you with the actual calculation that is needed. Thank you so much for your kind attention. Thank you so much, sir. Uh, Sir, do you believe that uh, the total catometry which is being used by in IL Master 700 has uh, better results than uh, Barrett toric calculator? Uh, yeah, in the sense that, you know, as far as toric intraocular lenses are shown uh, concerned, Barrett uh, himself has shown that the, with the Barrett TK formula, Barrett 2K, TK and Barrett TK toric formula, the results are slightly better. But in case you are doing in a post-refractive surgery scenario where that is a 
relationship between the anterior cornea and posterior cornea is disturbed. In that case, measuring the, actually measuring using a TK would be a good idea. But yeah. otherwise, in the run of the mill garden yeah. variety of cases, yeah. it may not be very important whether you use a direct uh, formula or a direct yes. TK formula. Yeah, yeah. And uh, there was a recent paper from Savini in which he showed that even uh, the total corneal refractive power compared with the Barrett toric had similar results. That's correct. So I think That's Barrett toric, as you also mentioned, it's an amazing formula and it's a very Absolutely. nice. Yeah. Absolutely. Any questions? And, and uh, how do you compare the manual versus the digital marking system used for toric uh, alignment? I do you find you any? If you have. Uh, access to a digital marking system like a Varion or a Calisto, nothing like it, because there's automatic compensation for cyclotorsion. Yeah. Vagaries of marking or is not there. But having said that, you, it's not that you can do toric intraoc lenses only if you have access to this. There are various ways of freehand marking using a bubble marker or even on the slit lamp uh, with the pupil undilated, with the uh, slit uh, splitting the pupil. Whatever you are comfortable with, I've done life surgery in different centers. Each center they use a different kind of marking. They are comfortable with that. Whatever you have mastered, whatever you are comfortable with, I think that's the way to go. But of course, if you can afford it and you have access to it, nothing like a digital marker. Any other question? So, your thoughts on multiple measurements and uh, multiple instruments for getting accurate key? Yeah. Well, that's a. Uh, I mean, sometimes when you get multiple measurements, it's kind of becomes confusing. But uh, mm -hmm. there is a, another Barrett formula which says that you know you can uh, input uh, measurements from three different uh, instruments. That is, you can take maybe from a pentacam, from an IOL master, from a simple keratometer, feed all these three inside. And then what happens is this has the ability to throw out the uh, outliers and just take the median. And when the median is taken into consideration, what Barrett says is 92% of these cases get uh, end up uh, getting less than 0.5 diopters residual astigmatism. So maybe if you are getting multiple measurements and they are slightly differing, you can resort to this kind of a formula. Let's just mo add a small point to this uh, further. We, we, when we ha started measuring the K with five or six different instruments, we got such a wide variety of Ks <laughs> that we really wondered whether we are on the right track. So sure. till we realized that the problem was not that much in the machines, it was in problem in how we place the head in the choir. So the, the placement has to be such that the, uh, the machine should move from one eye to the other eye, pupil center to pupil center. And at, at that point, when you start acquiring your results, uh, com come down to a level of five, six degrees between machines. And whenever we do a toric calculation, we pick up the two most reliable systems and then ensure that the difference is not more than three degrees. If it is not three degrees, we ask them to do it again. Repeat, repeat, repeat till you are within three degrees. And then we use that value. I mm -hmm. quite agree with you. You know, there's really not much sense in unless it's an irregular cornea or something doing in multiple instruments. Whatever equipment you have understood well and especially if it's an optical biometer, they have fairly repeatable K readings as well as axial length measurements. Mm -hmm. You can go with that. And how early would you like to uh, rotate the toric IOL? Uh, normally wait for about uh, two weeks time, you know, uh, in the sense that if it's grossly uh, not in yeah. question on the first day itself, I find that it's 20 degrees off, I would take up the patient on the first day. But uh, if not, otherwise it's been said that uh, you wait for a period of two weeks till the capsule slightly contracts and when you rotate the lens back into position, mm -hmm. it'll stay right there. So two weeks seems to be a spot, a sweet spot as far as, uh, and the mm. refractive error also stabilizes, you know, whatever residual error that is there, and that's the time period when rotation of the lens might be most optimal. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much, sir. I'd like to invite Dr. Partha, sir, for his talk on guide to cataract surgery after LVC, preferred practice guidelines. Thank you very much and thanks uh, to the ARC, which is a fantastic wing of the AIOS for giving this opportunity of the preferred practice pattern and Dr. Chitra and her team have come up with the preferred practice pattern, which really is something very valuable for us today, especially in the days of changing concepts. So the challenge which we have with uh, the laser, laser vision correction operated patients is what the biometry is all about. And Dr. Ramurthy spoke a little bit about the biometry and what is so unique about the challenge to the cataract surgeon. 
The challenge is also that these patients have been on a spectacle-free vision for years and years, and that is what they expect even after the cataract surgery. So their level of unrealistic expectation can be very high. And the other thing is the low accuracy of the current biometry formula. And uh, in the presentation, I'm going to show you how even our best formulas can err at times. So the refractive surprise and traditional formula lose its accuracy of the patients and post myopic refractive surgery patients end up with the difficulty of a post-operative hyperopia. And if it's a hyperopic refractive correction patient, then a post-operative myopia can also result. What are the sources of error? And of course, it is the keratometry mainly because what corneal measurements are taken from the central 2.5 to 3 millimeter zone, which has been actually flattened by the keratorefractive surgery. And that assumption that we have always take, taken is an overestimation that 15 to 25 percent is actually an overestimation. And if this is an overestimation, then the relation between the anterior and the posterior corneal curvature all is getting altered and the refractive index of 1.3375 becomes fallacious. So this is the basis and the errors in the formula and the estimation of the ELP also suffers and thereby a myopic patient with this formula predicts a false shallow ACD leading to an anterior ELP and again an overestimation of the IOL power causing the post-operative hyperopic surprise. So the traditional IOL formulas result in hyperopic surprise and when applied to a patient with post-myopic correction and in a, a myopic surprise, the patient has this post-hyperopic correction. So what formulas are used in this patient? Now, of course, we do not have the historical method. We do not uh, take on to this, but the ASCRS online, it gives the uh, a free accessible website and it gives multiple formula with which you can calculate. And also the average of all the formulas are also displayed. Tomography is very helpful, uh, especially the anterior and the posterior and the intraoperative ephakic calculation. Now, this is where I will stress a little and all said and done, all the formulas in place, everything available, but still we have not got to the ultimate. And where you need to prevent the post-operative hyperopic surprise and a very simple on-table retinoscopy after the extraction of the cataractus lens with the AC filled with viscoelastic just optimally and your best optometrist doing a, a refraction on the table will give you a near accurate value. You have to be a little on the myopic side and you will not have these hyperopic surprises. So of course there could be a, um, alteration of the IOP, the patient fixation and the pressure of the speculum, but and the ELP prediction will not be very accurate, but you will not err and you will not have a surprise. Intraoperative abrometry, of course, if it is available, it's a great tool, but these are expensive. But this is what I'm alluding you to. Uh, this optometrist of mine is taking the doing a retinoscopy on the table. And the next thing is the preoperative counseling, which is very important. And you have to prime the patient that these are the lenses that we'll give you. These are the ones that we will not give you. And there is a possibility of a surprise. We might have to exchange the lens if required. The intraoperative challenges are not many and you just go ahead, but you have to be very careful because the flap is still there. And let us remember the edge of the flap has healed, but if there is a rough uh, handling, then it might lift up. So let's uh, tell you about this mystery case and where I'm going to tell you about how uh, there can be fallacies. This was a lady who came in and uh, grade two cataract wanted to plan FACO plus IOL. And then uh, we did a um, biometric calculation and everything and also a pentacam. But what we saw on the pentacam is this, this flattening was there. So, you know, we were a little suspicious. And then the patient comes in again and uh, without her husband this time and says that I had some surgery done about 18, 19 years ago, and uh, that was to remove my glasses. So we got the clue, and we did the calculations, and you can see from these calculations that uh, uh, we did the pentacam, the, uh, the, uh, uh, the value that we took from the pentacam was the flattest value, and 
we did not take, of course, the readings from the biometry. What we assessed from our on-table retinoscopy was 15 diopters, and we placed a 15 diopters lens. Now look at this. We also had taken multiple printouts, and here on the ASAR's online calculation, the average IOL power that was read was 12. Now, we did not take a 12 or a, even a 12.5, but we went by the reliability of our optometrist, who said it would be approximately 15, and we got a, a, a good correction for this patient. So this was the correction that we got for this patient, 0.75 with a one adapter cylinder in both the eyes nearly. So this is to reinstate that check, check, and cross-check is very important. Post-operative challenges uh, uh, can be there. And to manage the larger errors, if it has happened, of course, an ex IOL exchange or a piggyback is an option. And thank you very much for your patient hearing. Thank you so much, sir. Sir, there was a paper by Dr. Savini on this where they said that if there is a decentered ablation, mm. then none of the newer formula no, also will, will work. work. Exactly. So, but in routine post LASIK, they will work. But if it's a decentered, severely decentered ablation, then no. you have to do the only way to do it is by a fake refraction. Thank you so I'll much, sir. I'll make a short comment here, sir. Uh, Dr. Yeah. For a good number of people who don't have access to these new formulas with the new machines, <coughs> and many a times they ask this question, sir, please tell us, we have a lens a person who's had a LASIK done. So a traditional way to uh, reasonably predict for all these last 25 years is that if it was a low myope, add 2.5, medium myope at 3.5 and a high myope at 4.5 to a standard IUL power calculation. So, but many and times you may not the have the previous rules, this thing. Just, and this is, another thing is we is have rough. access to online ASCRS calculators today. Everything is fine, but so still for a person who doesn't have access or he just wants a simple solution, at least he'll be somewhere close and not have our hyperopia plus four lands. So yes, sir. Yeah. In these uh, times, I would definitely yeah. say that, you know, if, uh, if our doctor does not have access to these formula, it's best to refer it to somewhere else you or get a, a access. You can get it done from your colleagues because, also. You know, I mean, erring I mean, at this point of time, especially with a patient who is so used to accurate vision, would be really detrimental. Yeah, uh, in the interest of time, sir, I think uh, we'll go on with the next presentation. Dr. Srinivas and Harshul are remaining. So, Dr. I'll, uh, uh, thank you, madam. Uh, thank you, Chitra, madam. I'll try to finish my talk in three or four no minutes thanks maximum. To me. Three minutes? Okay. Yes. Okay. So this is about the management of the CME post cataract surgery. So I'll just give you, see this picture. Do we see anything? No. This was actually a patient on diabetes, post cataract surgery done two months, 624 right eye pseudopachia. Okay. So this is the OCT picture which shows IRF, SRF, both the things. Now coming to the next 55 year old male, treatment on diabetes since 15 years, cataract surgery done, left eye 69, quite pseudophakia. See the fundus pictures, again, no much of clinical changes. See the OCT, you see some IRF changes, some cysts here. So this is the another case, diabetes, hypertension, so, uh, di hypertension was 160, 100, now you see this edema, right? So now, if you have to differentiate the post cataract CME, I think definitely you can do it on the OCT as well if things are not very clear on the clinical fundus photo pictures. So there are various things. It can be a vascular cause, Irwin gas, when we usually call it as post cataract surgery, inflammatory, retinal dystrophies, drug induced, or even the tractional component. So it can be due to various causes. But see here, the pseudophakic cystoid macular edema is the most common complication post cataract surgery. All of us know that. But in most of the time, it goes away well. It doesn't go away well. That is when the, the, the visual loss keeps happening in those patients. So there are various systemic causes for having post uh, cataract surgery, CME, ocular conditions, the surgery associated like uh, inadvertent iris trauma, posterior capsular rupture, vitreous loss, vitreous traction, etc, etc. Now look at this. This looks pretty much sim similar, isn't it? If this had a subfoveal fluid, then definitely we would like to have to confuse it as a PCME when the patients present two months post cataract surgery. But this is actually a DME and not a CME. But here it is cleanly CME. So how do we differentiate it? Usually the foveal contour is often preserved in DME, whereas in pseudophakic CME it is altered. And most important is the location of the cysts. 
it's in DME, most importantly, it's in the ONL layer, whereas in pseudophagic, it's mainly in the inner retinal layer or inner nuclear layer. And 25% uh, of the patients only have DME, whereas 75 to 100% of the patients usually have subretinal fluid. So this is one of the striking features we need to differentiate it. Look at this. This is a cystoid space in the center, but you see some hyperreflective foci here, hard exudates. So this goes more in favor of DME and not CME. But look at this, there is no hyperreflective foci, no hard exudate. But the confusion comes is when this starts having hyperreflective foci and hard exudates, that is when we have to differentiate between PCME and DME. Okay? So what are the various treatment options available quickly? NSAIDs are I, I think the best because it inhibits cyclo uh, oxygenase enzyme. And many papers post cataract surgery have shown that topical NSAIDs are more effective than topical steroids in preventing PCME. Octa ophthalmological journey has shown that there is no much difference between nepafenac and preservative free nepafenac. The only thing is the tolerability is slightly better in the preservative free actually otherwise there is no much of uh, uh, effects on the uh, CME. Pseudophagic cystoid mac ketrolac alone versus <coughs> ketrolac and platinis alone again no statistically significant difference found amongst the two group. So the most important we need to know is the corticosteroid actually acts at the phospholipase A2 level whereas the cyclogenase act at the, the NSAIDs act at the cyclooxygenase level that is COX-1 and COX-2 inhibitors. So chronic macular edema, irvine gas, what I suggest, I, I usually practice is just give a simple postal subtenone injection if it is not responding with NSAIDs. Comparison of subtenone versus topical nepafenac treatment, PCME have shown that nepafenac in fact is slightly more efficacious, that's what few of the studies have shown. But Again, the other studies, if you see low dose triamcinol astonide, ranibizumab, then they say if the patient is poor, not very affordable, then you can even go with the IVTA as well. In another paper, very recent 2021, topical NSAIDs, DEX versus peribulbar, have shown that overall success rate is very much. If you see here, 60% of the resolution happened with the topical NSAIDs alone. But in rest 40 patients, the patient who had seven patients, they uh, went into intravitreal uh, dexamethasone implant, in rest, they went into the post subtenone injection. But all, all of the 100% of the cases, they went well. So there are, there are various things. I'll not go into the detail of it. And uh, the supracoroidal injections can also be tried. They are pretty much safe now. Lot of anti vegfs are available because it also has an anti-inflammatory property. And this is one paper which has shown Pan-American Collaborative Retina Study Group shows that IVT bevacizumab is also well tolerated in refractory pseudophagic CME, in persistent refractory please make, no, make a note of it. And of course, surgery when there is tractional component, in non-tractional component, theoretically it is to remove the inflammatory fract factors which are actually causing the CME in the vitreous cavity. And uh, this is the study uh, which shows and I would like to acknowledge our fellow Dr. Rohan Dedia for uh, giving me the cases and helping mm -hmm. me in this. Thank you very much for the patient listening. Thank you so much Dr. Srinima. That was an excellent presentation. We now have our uh, uh, very own Dr. Harshul Tuck. He would be speaking to us on subluxated cataract. We'll just take a few minutes of the next session, please. So uh, really thank all the expert panels for being here and uh, all the audience also for being uh, here with us today for this preferred practice guidelines. Yeah. yeah. So thank you so much, Dr. Anaga. AV so team, can you please come? Yes, yeah. so it's a very uh, vast topic, but I uh, just be showing you one or two videos. So we all know that the causes of subluxation can be congenital or developmental, or it can be acquired because of trauma or pseudo exfoliation. So if we if you look at the classification of degree of lens subluxation, it can be minimal to mild if lens edge it uncovers uh, up till 25 percent of dilated pupil. It's moderate if it uncovers 25 to 50% of the dilated pupil and it's severe if it uncovers greater than 50%. So clinical evaluation is very important. You have to look at the uh, evaluation of the subluxated lens edge. So if lens edge is flat, it means that the remaining zonular fibers should be fairly healthy and strong. But if the lens edge is rounded, it, it shows that uh, the intact fiber, adjacent fibers may not have sufficient strength and we may need to use the capsule retractors uh, at the initial phase of the surgery. 
and it's very important to compare the position of the crystalline lens when the patient is seated at slit lamp and in the supine position also. It also gives a clue, clue to the degree of zonular compromise which is there. So you have to look for vitreous prolapse which you can see around the area of zonular loss. If it's there, it, uh, you need to go and do a partial vitrectomy before you start doing the, your case. And of course, posterior segment has to be elevated. So there are a few signs which suggest that there may be loose or broken zonules. If you see, there may be phacodonesis, iodonesis, the anterior chamber is irregular in depth, vitreous in anterior chamber, or we may see them intraoperatively. So intraoperative signs which suggest that the zonules are weak is the radial folds when you start uh, doing capsular axis, even when you are puncturing the anterior capsule. And if you see the excessive movement of the lens during capsular axis, if there is difficulty in nucleus rotation, or if you realize that there is vitreous herniation around the lens. So surgical approach depends on the degree of the zonular weakness which is there. If it's less than four clock hours, a CTR or CTS will work here. Uh, if, it's, if it's four to nine clock hours of zonular dialysis, then uh, we need to either use CTR along with capsule tension segment, which is easier to use, or you can use a Sioni CTR and suture it to the sclera. And if it's greater than nine clock hours of subluxation, then of course it's uh, no use in uh, using all these heroic maneuvers and you just go ahead and do uh, SFIL or ACL or eyes fixated, I will whatever it feels. So, I'll skip all these slides because we have very limited time. And I'll just go on to one of the case. So you can see here, this was a traumatic subluxation and uh, it, it also had a fibrotic anterior capsule. So it's difficult to initiate the capsular axis. So, but once you initiate it, use a micro capsular axis forceps to uh, start capsular axis here. Because this is a fibrotic anterior capsule, you should never try to pull through it. So use a uh, micro scissors using a bimanual technique and you can. So it's very important when you come in the area of the subluxation that you have at least two 2.5 millimeter of the uh, capsular excess margin, which is very important to use the capsular hooks to support, to give the entire posterior stability to the uh, lens back complex. So once you have this after that you go ahead and put some dispersive OVD there and use capsular hooks. So either here you can use capsular hooks to support, use two or three capsular hooks or you can use the capsular tension segment here at this time also and hook the capsular tension segment with the one of the iris hooks and once you have done the FACO you can take off the iris hooks and stabilize and, and anchor that CTS segment itself. So once I have stabilize it in the anterior posterior direction, I go ahead and do FACO. Remember that never let your anterior chamber collapse because that collapse may increase the herniation of the vitreous or the entire capsular bag may prolapse. So always do visco exchange. So I go ahead and do visco exchange and take out my FACO probe. And once the roll of the capsular hook is finished, I take them off and stabilize it by putting a Sioni ring here. So here the Sioni goes and once the Sioni ring goes, it gives equatorial uh, support to the capsular bag. So these two supports are very important that you need to give it equatorial support and anterior posterior support. And because this zonular dialysis was more than four clock hours, I need to put a, a CTS segment here. So it ha it's made of PMMA and it has uh, one eyelet. So I put a 90 proline. So 90, I, you can use either 90 proline or now many surgeons started using Gore-Tex suture. So put this segment in the capsular phonics, make a pocket to uh, in the sclera and railroad the two arms of the proline suture. And once you take this out, you put a knot there, bury the knot and you have a well-centered and uh, stabilized capsular bag and then uh, choice of the IOL, if it's uh, well-centered and uh, uh, capsular bag, you can use a single piece or a three-piece IOL and uh, 
toric you can use in cases uh, in limited cases but multifocal you should try to avoid in these type of cases so i think with this we'll finish this session thank you very much thank you very much and the harshul we all know is an amazing surgeon he show you great videos i am sure i do hope that at the end of this uh, preferred practice guidelines on cataract surgery there were some more tips which you picked up here and there i do hope dr sanjay choudhury uh, was able to contribute to discussions actively though i was very sorry that i had to move away for a period of time thank you very much my moderators uh, harshul anagha was there right from the beginning thank you so much and tamil thank you one and all chitra ma'am thank you chitra for organizing such a lovely session very informative very fast fast fast